today it is a again, kind of a sad day, and I sort of wish that we weren't having to be here. But yesterday we learned that 427,000 Arkansans have lost their, their, their health care coverage, at the very least had it interrupted or terminated altogether by the Department of Human Services and this governor. Some of those have been re-enrolled, but as I think a lot of people around this room know, it's the interruption itself that for so many of these people, it, it, it's not just an inconvenience. It can delay or terminate necessary medical procedures. I mean, this, these are people's lives that we're gambling with here. And I knew this was going on, and I think a lot of us knew this was going on, but it wasn't until I read what our DHS secretary said yesterday that I, I finally just I, I got mad. <laughs> um, she told us that the program now, after this six-month period, is only serving those who really need Medicaid. That's a lie. And you can write that down. I'm saying it's a lie. And here's how I know. Because we know that somewhere close to 70% of the people who've been terminated were terminated only because they didn't respond to a letter or answer a telephone call. No determination as to their eligibility for medical purposes was ever made on these people. So to say the only people left on the rolls are those who truly need Medicaid, you either don't understand the program you run or you're lying to the people of Arkansas. This needs to be fixed. And it needs to be fixed now for a whole bunch of reasons that many of you in this room have been writing about for 10 or 15 years. Throwing people off of Medicaid has incredible tentacles and impacts across Arkansas's economy and across Arkansas's healthcare landscape. You can't throw all of these people off of the rolls and keep your rural hospitals open and serving everybody the way we depend on them to do. We've already got rural hospitals around this state saying maybe we need to get out of the inpatient business and just go into the outpatient business. So if you become deathly ill and you live anywhere but about four or five places in this state, in the future, if you need to go to the hospital, you better hope that you're paid up on your life flight or that one of MEMS buses or any of the other buses around town can get to where you are and back to a big hospital in time to save your life. This is a terrible idea. We're talking about people in communities around this state losing access to specialists because there are just not enough paying customers left in the area to keep these people there and working. You want to talk about the fact that you're disappointed with the performance in your schools? Let's talk about health care. Let's talk about preventative health care for pre-K kids. You're worried about crime? Let's talk about preventative health care, particularly in the mental health space, which is a place we need more work and a place where we have consistently over and over and over again said to the federal government, we don't want those dollars. You want to talk about improving our economy overall and making sure that people who are capable work Let's talk about health care. We are cutting off our nose to spite our face. We think we're going to save money by throwing people off of this coverage and in the end, not treating people when they're sick, not giving people preventative health care when they're young is going to wind up costing us, in the end, millions more. 
than we would spend on Medicaid. They know because they've done it on purpose. There have been bills passed over the course of the last 10 years that basically make it impossible for DHS to reach out to these people in ways that they have in the past. I was here, not in this building, but in this state and covering this stuff. When we started our kids in the first place, I remember how they signed people up for our kids. I have lived through a couple of other Medicaid re-enrollments. Those folks at DHS know how to find these folks. They've been doing it for years. We've now made it illegal and taken away some of their best tools. You can't have community programs and thoughts and ideas and discussions anymore about around any of these issues. It's illegal. Because they don't want people to get health care. Why? I don't know, but somebody ought to ask them, for real and true, why don't you want people to have health care? It is time for the Republicans in the legislature and this governor to step up to the task of fixing what they've broken. Because leaving it broken imperils Arkansas's economy. It imperils health care for all of us in Arkansas. It impairs our schools. It, it's just about the worst idea of the many bad ideas they've had. So I suppose this is us here today saying, you broke it, you fix it. And now I would like to bring on the Minority Leader of the House, Representative Tippy McCall. Thank you, Grant. Thank you all for being here today. Um, DHS has described the unwinding, the continuous enrollment conditions, one of the largest and most complex efforts for state Medicaid programs since the implement, implementation of the Affordable Care Act. In April, DHS said they didn't know whether 50,000, 120,000, or 150,000, 200,000 Arkansans would lose Medicaid coverage during the six month unwinding period. Turns out they were off by over 227,000, over double their highest estimate at the time. Arkansas has a higher percentage, 65% of children in rural areas enrolled in Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program than any other state, according to the analysis by the Georgetown University for Children and Families. We're already the highest need state, and our policy for the past six months has been to strip the very children in most need of health care. We have to fix that broken system. Arkansas has, by some estimates, the highest rate of disenrollment of any state in the entire country. Just last month, 21,630 people had their cases closed for failure to return a renewal form. Another 9,750 didn't return some other piece of requested information. We've heard story after story of Arkansas families and their children being robbed of the stability of continued health care coverage. People are showing up in waiting rooms to see a doctor and they're being told that they can't receive care and the state's response is too bad, check your mail, look for your denial letter. Just yesterday, a woman in central Arkansas told us that she's checked the st status of her daughter's Medicaid and it showed active. When she arrived at her appointment, she was told that her daughter couldn't be seen because her Medicaid was inactive. She called DHS, filled out the form, and they claimed that they claimed was missing. It took about two months to get her Medicaid active with many calls and visits to DHS. She also noticed, noted she got different information during each call and visit on why the process was being slowed down. This story is the same for thousands across the state. The state and the governor were warned of this countless times during the process. The call time, wait, and disconnection rate were the worst in the nation, according to CMS. They were told that, but shrugged it off because they refused to meet people where they are. Laws can be changed, and they should be. How can you look at these numbers and not think that the system has failed Arkansas families? Democrats, as always, are committed to a healthier Arkansas. To us, this means 
affordable and quality health care insurance to every single Arkansan. Our work's not done and to each of our family and neighbors are secure in their access to health insurance. Thank you. Does Grant want to take back? We'll take some questions. Yeah, sure. And then uh, we'll have uh, Neil Steele from ACO talk. Okay. But go ahead and take some questions, Grant. Okay. okay. <laughs> Who's got some questions? <laughs> so uh, your uh, little sign here says that the Sanders administration has stolen health care coverage from 140,000 children and 427,000 Arkansans. Is that your allegation? My allegation? Well, I, I think stolen is an interesting word, but there were this many people who had coverage who no longer have it. Some of them have been added back, but we don't know. Some of these numbers are so difficult to understand, I don't know if this number is inclusive of that number, and I can't find that. But, but I mean, so you're saying that... You they, how many of those people do you think make more than the Medicaid program allows and they were, they're no longer eligible? I, I have no idea. And that's a big part of the problem. What I do know is that when asked, to, well, first, they told us how many people just weren't responding, and then they stopped. But now they're willing to tell us that some of these are part of, what's the phrase they're using? procedural error. That means they didn't respond to the letter or to the phone call. So I try and, Mike, you call me all the time. I try and call you and you don't answer. If I never call you back, am I not in trouble anymore? <laughs> so you don't buy the argument that they say a lot of these people are no longer eligible for the program. Tell me. And they're just not sending in the, 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 uh, the documents. And that explains what's going on. Oh. I, I've talked to enough providers that I know, and Tippy described it perfectly accurately a few moments ago. Long-term patients of a dentist, as a for instance, show up for their annual cleaning that's been on the books for eight months. And they get there. And their um, hygienist, who's been cleaning their teeth for years, opens up their thing, and the thing says, wait a minute, you've lost your coverage. And so they turn, sometimes, to a teenage child, even better, to a disabled teenage child, and say, I can't clean your teeth because the computer tells me you don't have insurance coverage anymore. We don't know whether that person is making the minimum, we don't know. In the cases that I'm aware of, the person never received the letter because they don't live in the place where their uh, coverage is attached to anymore and haven't for years. So you know of people who have filled out their paperwork, were eligible, but were not re-enrolled in the program? I know of at least one for sure. <laughs> No, and I'll talk to you about why not later. This is a well, disabled who youth. That someone can't be reached. I mean, if you're reaching out to someone, okay, but here's my point, Roby. It, it, when we signed everybody up for our kids in the first place, we didn't say, "Up, oh, can't reach you." Bye. Right. We went over and over and over. And when during these re-enrollment periods, I remember because a couple of them happened during the BB administration, we were holding community events. We were feeding people lunch. We were doing all kinds of things to get them to show up and get on the coverage. We've stopped doing all of that. We can do a better job of finding these people than we're doing. And the reason we oughta is that it's bad for the economy, it's bad for healthcare, it's bad for education, it's bad for a whole slew of things we all say we care about. I get what you're saying and how you're trying and how we've reached them in the past and how you're advocating reaching them. I'm just saying, do you have proof that there are people besides this one person that you can't identify that has that is part of a larger group of this 140,000 or 427,000? 
mean, are we talking 10,000 people, 50,000 people? Uh, I mean, how do we, because the only information we have to go on is what the government agency that's responsible for this program presents to us. Right. I can't refuse information that I don't have access to. Okay. But have they said what the 70% who are, what did they call it, process error? What is that? These are real human beings who need health care. And we're throwing 70% of them out because of process errors? And we're not going back and trying to find these people? I mean, I, I guess... I'm just saying that we've been told repeatedly, because we've asked repeatedly, that they have been multiple attempts to reach these people and they cannot successfully reach these people so I just I how are they trying I understand phone calls and letters I don't know if they're doing personal visits but if a phone number is not good anymore if an address isn't good anymore how do you find it from maybe they moved out of state maybe they died maybe they okay so why don't we try some of the things we've tried in the past in terms of giving people an incentive to show up someplace and talk about their health care status. Um, we've done those sorts of things. Jane? Mr. Chair, can I interject here? Sure. Uh, excuse me, I'm Janie Cotton, and I'm not speaking on behalf as vice chair of the party. Oh, you are. I'm, speak I'm a retired CEO of mental health, and I'm also a licensed professional counselor. You can find that information. I can tell you this is just the second of a big progressive amount taken off. It was taken off uh, over five years ago, and we had to get our professional case managers to go to the homes to help find these people. But a lot of our clients, and we serve three to 4,000 clients a year at Professional Counseling Associates, and we, they can get you that information from the mental health perspective because we keep up with those records. I'm no longer there, I'm retired, but I know everybody that works in that field. We had to get advocates to go find the people because they would show up at our offices and still doing that now without Medicaid coverage. Well, you know clients with mental health issues also have to have their medication. And so that was a problem going to the drugstore. It still exists. Uh, advocates are so important when you're talking about Medicaid because a lot of people don't have computers. They sent letters out through technology. A lot of people didn't have phone numbers. A lot of those persons uh, had moved, as Grant stated, and that still occurs today. So there are opportunities because we did it. We went and found them and advocated and went to the office with them to get them back on. So some of the crux of the argument is we don't do the advocate outreach anymore to reach some of these people that are falling through the cracks, and you're advocating that the, that's because a law changed that doesn't allow that. Yes, one of the things. I think there's a That's lack of desire, first yeah. and foremost, but I think we've yeah. also passed some laws. I'm not familiar with the laws that have changed on this. You remember who the sponsor was? We can send that along to you right Yeah, yeah. we got it. Some specific well, laws. And I also want to say, you know, the nature of needing this kind of care in the first place is because of some things that are going on in your life. Maybe you're having to move. Maybe you've been kicked out of your house. Maybe, I mean, there are a lot of things that can happen to people. But if you want to say, well, they're adults, they need to take care of this kind of business. I mean, if that's not where I want to go, but if that's what people want to say, that's okay. But a lot of these people have children. And mm -hmm. that's and we should be able to track down children that are at least of school age. We should yes. be able to. And so there's some way to track this stuff down. But um, we can't just continue to blame people for not taking care of their business when business is often hard to take care of, even as a, a, a representative up there at the mm -hmm. Capitol. It's hard for me to take care of my business lots of times. So, you know, folks that are struggling in their lives, it's even harder. And, and, and Roby, sitting here for the last couple of seconds thinking about it, here I think would be my answer right back at you, which is before, to, to Tippy's point, before you go taking health insurance away from children, you better know they're not eligible. It shouldn't be, well, we couldn't get in touch with you, so you're not eligible. It should be, we're going to, if you were eligible once, until we can talk to you and truly determine your eligibility, we ought to keep you on. Okay. Um, what law or laws were you referring to earlier when you said that, that there have been laws passed in recent years? That Reed just said to Roby that we'll get it to you right after. We'll send it to you right after. Thanks. Well, attached to the press release. I presume, you're, I presume you're referring to like navigators. They, 
Yeah. Yep. Right. yep. Right. Flippo's law. Or I think it was a Flippo bill, if I remember I in the back of my mind. Um, but again, we, we ought to be able to say, you know, before we throw you off, we're going to make sure you're not eligible because the cost to the person you're throwing off just because you can't get in touch with them, to them personally, probably far outweighs what it's costing us as a taxpayer to keep them on until we can make darn sure they shouldn't have their health insurance taken away. Outside of the procedural um, removal via the card of letters and the um, phone calls and not being able to get in contact with these people, is there any stock in like, I mean, anecdotally about um, like glitches in the DHS system or maybe not, they don't have the capacity to handle it? The, the Biden White House sent, you know, the C CHS sent letters about the yeah. And, and I think again, those are the sorts of questions that we think these folks ought to ought to answer, and they ought to answer them now. Um, but you know, I, I think you know, back and and I probably failed uh, right there. And, and you got me to it. Um, they ought to keep all the cases open that the government's failed to connect with until they can connect with them. The, the automatic assumption shouldn't be, we couldn't get in touch with you, therefore you're, you've started making a bunch of money and you're too busy to call us back, therefore we're going to cut off your insurance. I mean, come on. If you can't get in touch with these folks, it, it, there are all kinds of reasons. But you ought to have to before you take away their health insurance. Is there any It's fantastic that you asked that question. <laughs> Sir, come on up here. All right. Tell these folks who you are and what you're doing. Okay. My name is Neil Seeley, and I work with Arkansas Community Organizations. We have an organization of Medicaid recipients. We have been talking to DHS for a couple of years. We met with the new director back in February gave her some recommendations, one of which was navigators. And of course, there's the legislation, but you know, you can get around that. It's, you got to do real reach out. We found some horrible things happening. Uh, one thing, a couple of people that I've talked to, they worked, they had a very brief job for a weekend. They were given a form that they had to sign uh, that, uh, by the former employer, and that prevented them from uh, getting or keeping their coverage. We solved those problems, but that's outrageous. The other abuse we see is there, I'm on Social Security, and many people that I know, uh, they're earning a thousand a month in their Social Security check. <coughs> If they're deemed ineligible for QMB or one of the other supplementals, they get their Social Security check dinged sometimes, and they have to pay the Part B. And I've, every one of these people, I've talked to two people, has been eligible for one of the programs under Medicaid that can pay the Part B. So we've gotten some of there a couple of people's uh, Social Security checks made whole again, but that's outrageous. So from a th around a thousand bucks a month, you're down to 700, 500 is what we've seen. So uh, there's a lot that needs to be cleaned up. We are actively reaching out to people. Uh, we will continue to do so. We will bring those cases to DHS and we'll continue to advocate and build our group of Medicaid recipients to make this service available to all who need it. Healthcare is a human right. And so if anyone would like a flyer, happy to give it to you. Have all the cases that you mentioned about, uh, about this, you know, they got a brief job and were given a form to sign, uh, if we're going to coverage, have all the cases that you're aware of that had that scenario, they've been reinstated. Only because you know. we brought it up, but just think of how many thousands of other people right. may be in the same situation. Do you think there's all how many cases that you don't reinstate? 
uh, uh, we've helped a bunch get reinstated, but on the two examples I gave, uh, there's one I got to follow up with uh, on the little employment form. The other, uh, she got her Medicaid reinstated, still having problems with the child's Medicaid. Uh, then on the dinging the Social Security check, I've gotten one guy's, two or three people back, uh, their money back. Uh, there's one I've got to follow up on. Okay. Uh-huh. All right, if nothing else. Thank you. Thank you all. We'll follow up with the release uh, video from this as well as uh, the, the navigator laws. Uh, if you have any other additional questions, let us know. And we intend to talk about this throughout the uh, 2024 campaign. We're going to have a lot more people. Now, just in a few posts that we posted yesterday about it, we had a lot of people flood in comments about you know, that they had issues with their Medicaid. Uh, and so, as we have more of those people willing to go on the record and, and share their stories, we'll do on our platforms as well as have events like this. Uh, but we appreciate you all.